Hello and welcome to Legally Speaking with me, Tarun Nangia. Today, we're going to delve into a really interesting topic, uh, which uh, in a sense caught my eye when I read this article written by advocate Samarth Krishan Luthra. The article is titled, I will read, American Model of Discretionary Sentencing, Lessons for India. It's a very interesting uh, title, I must say. Also, the fact that I've always been fascinated by the fact that judges when they record their findings in a judgment, uh, they can go through the same pieces of evidence and uh, can lead to different uh, uh, judgments. Uh, as we have seen uh, uh, judgments in district courts, high court and then Supreme Court, sometimes they are overturned. Sometimes the quantum of sentencing is reduced. So you actually are going through the same piece of evidence, uh, but looking at it from a different perspective, again, arriving at a conclusion. That's why discretion in sentencing is something that fascinates me. Uh, it is something uh, uh, that is uh, uh, very, very, very interesting to follow as we follow the fate of different cases as they move on from one court to the higher court to the highest court in the land. Uh, but today, uh, my guest is somebody who's delved into this aspect in detail in his long article. Uh, so uh, let me introduce to you for the first time on weekly speaking advocate. Samarth Krishan Lutra. Good to see you, Samarth, and welcome on Legally Speaking. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Good to see you too. Uh, Samarth, uh, well, uh, this uh, headline caught my eye, uh, but uh, you want to explain uh, to all of us and the viewers, uh, what is the introduction uh, of uh, this headline? What is this article all about? So my article is rather, I'll start at the very beginning. Yeah. As a young practitioner, when you go to court, personally, when I went to court, I saw a lot of emphasis on what goes on during arguments pertaining to convictions, acquittals, but not a lot of focus in sentencing. We often forget that sentencing is a very important part of any criminal justice system. One, one part of it, of course, is to say that fair enough, so-and-so has committed so-and-so offense, you convict them or you acquit them. But what after conviction? What's the purpose behind the conviction? It's the sentence. There's a reason for the sentence. There's a reason why sentencing is very important in a lot of jurisdictions across the world. But sadly, in India, I don't see much of a focus in sentencing, which is what led me to write this article. Once I started exploring the concept of sentencing in India, I looked at the extreme opposite, a, a jurisdiction where the concept of sentencing or rather the manner in which the sentencing proceedings are conducted is completely different, which is the United States of America, A, for that reason, B, of course, being a jurisdiction where certain laws came to be developed earlier, their constitutions about 200 odd years older than ours. I decided to look at the American model as one end of the spectrum and the Indian model is the other end of the spectrum. And as you were talking about the introduction, my introduction focuses on something very important as far as sentencing is concerned, that's discretion. How does one deal with discretion in sentencing? Where do you draw the line between discretion and over discretion? Where do you, did, how do you determine what is a sentence versus what is a just sentence? For the policy of sentencing, rather the ideology behind sentencing should be, should be to impose just sentences and not merely any sentence. Uh, if you could delve into this word that you just said, just, what is a just sentence in your view as you have read it? You're cracking up, I'm sorry. So, when you said that a just sentence, uh, this word carries a lot of weight when you said what is just. So could you delve into the fact that what is just in your opinion, hypothetically, without, without uh, referring to any case, if you could just delve into the importance of this word just, uh, what is a just sentence? In absolutely, absolutely. A just sentence is one which is, to put it simply, which is necessary to achieve the purpose of sentencing in that particular case, whether it be to deter others from committing a similar offense or to reform the accused 
or for that matter to rehabilitate, reform and rehabilitate the accused. Or one very often also looks at the concept of retributive sentencing or to achieve the goals of retribution as far as the victim is concerned. Just is necessary to achieve these purposes, but nothing more than that. If, for instance, I commit an offense today and I am held guilty, after that, if two years is enough to achieve the goals of the sentence uh, or the goals of the punishment, rather, to say that I will not commit, commit this offense again or other similarly situated people will not commit a similar offense, if two years is enough, what is the point behind putting me behind bars for 10 years for the same case? Just is what is necessary, is what I'll say. On this. I want to ask you one more follow-up question. You've referred to a comment by Professor A. Lakshmi Nath, uh, where you said in the article that discretion is indispensable in sentencing. Uh, otherwise, sentencing would be reduced to computer programming. Okay. This offense, this sentence. Uh, could you delve into the role of discretion in sentencing? Because uh, as I also mentioned in the introduction that uh, judges may go through the same piece of evidence and give vastly different sentences. So discretion in sentencing, rather yes. discretion in sentencing is what is important to achieve individualized sentences. Okay. Based on your circumstances, for every person, if we say talk about the concept as I was mentioning of uh, Reformation. Reformation to say that you place person A and B who committed the same offense. You wish to reform both A and B. The judge needs to, or any court for that matter, needs to use its discretionary powers to ensure that the sentence is individualized qua A and qua B. If a certain period is enough to reform A, while you need twice the amount of that period of sentence to reform person B. That's where discretion comes into play to ensure that the sentence is individualized qua A and qua B. That's where the minimum and the maximum terms come. Whether you give the person a minimum term, a slightly larger or the maximum term to prison. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. Or not even Mas minimum or maximum. There's another issue there, which is very interesting. Unlike certain jurisdictions, where the minimum and the maximum is much shorter or the sentence is graded in a manner where the offense, the, the punishment will be, the maximum difference will be say 12 months, 24 months. In India, we have That's cases where the minimum is a fine. You get a slap on your wrist and you're let off or the maximum range is up to seven years. So I want to ask you very uh, interestingly, this stems from your article. Uh, where you say in the article that uh, America and United Kingdom have developed guidelines, statutory or otherwise, uh, to curb wide-ranging discretion. Are you hinting to the fact that uh, there is very less difference between what is minimum and maximum in America and UK? So the concept in America is slightly different. Before I deal with the UK, America yes. developed a very interesting concept in 1987, in 1984, actually, they they brought into the play something known as the United States Sen Sentencing Commission. This commission promulgated its guidelines. The guidelines were in the form of a graded chart where every offense had a base grade level. Grade level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, similarly, and every grade level along with it had a prescribed a punishment in terms of months where the discretion was mi minimal, a few months apart. So grade one punishment is X to Y months. Coupled with this, they said you look at certain other factors, aggravating and mitigating factors, similar to what we have in Indian jurisprudence as developed in the celebrated cases of um, Machi Singh, etc. So they developed this guideline grid system rather, where I commit offense in level one. However, there are certain mitigate, aggravating circumstances. Based on those aggravating circumstances, you connect grid number one to grid number five on the second column. Then there will be certain mitigating circumstances that takes you up to grid number three. And accordingly, your sentence was determined. 
the and america in fact brought this about in the 1980s to curb discretion which they thought was leading to incons inconsistency in sentencing inconsistency was very important because as you know and your view lawyer viewers know that the the goal of the and the goal in a common law jurisdiction is to have uniformity certainty which is why we have precedents and precedents have binding value similarly in sentencing they thought there was no uniformity, which is why they brought this about. This went on till the mid 2000s, when in America, they realized that while it was good to the extent that it was doing away with, uh, doing away with rather ensuring uniformity, doing away with disparity in sentences. However, sentencing in America, to a large extent, lost the human touch. The human touch of individualized sentences. Which is why they turned around and they finally said that enough, these guidelines will no longer be mandatory, rather they'll be advisory. So the duty was cast upon every federal judge in America to refer to the guidelines, rather to start with refer to seven factors, which is the same as the factors in India, nature of the offense, manner of commission, characteristics of the accused, etc., Start with that, then you refer to the guidelines, the same grid system, you, and you come to a particular period within which, rather a particular category where the, of sentence, where you have a minimum and a maximum, which does not have much of a difference. And then the judge applies his or her independent mind there, uses his or her discretion, and then decides whether the period of sentence that the judge has arrived upon at is correct or not correct. And accordingly, the judge can make departures, whether upwards or downwards. So that's- In UK, the system is different. In UK, the system is different. And why the UK is important now, for, for while I've not covered the UK in my analysis, the UK, our Indian laws, as we all know, have been taken from UK laws. Initially, we had the 1898 CRPC, which dealt with sentencing. Now we've got the 1973 CRPC, not much change. Of course, there are some localized amendments which make it different from the UK law, which was which stood at that stage. The UK changed the sentencing system in the, a few 20, 30 odd years, if not more actually. The UK changed the system where they decided to grade offenses. So you take a particular, number one, offenses are graded in a particular manner in terms of whether the offense is a run-of-the-mill simple offense or if it's a very heinous offense. Then again, based on the aggravating and mitigating circumstances, they dealt, they deal with how there have to be upward or downward shifts as far as the sentence is concerned. Our, our jurisdiction, like South Africa, India on the other hand, are on a completely different footing where there is a minimum, there is a maximum as I'd mentioned, where the minimum may be a mere fine and the maximum may be up to seven years, 10 years in prison. With And the judge has the sole discretion to decide what the apt sentence or the adequate, or as I had earlier said, and you asked, what the just sentence would be. It's purely discretionary based on these mitigating and aggravating circumstances. Now, uh, in your article, uh, you've said, uh, New Zealand, South Africa, and India, trial courts enjoy considerable freedom to determine sentences. So, uh, why did you give the example of uh, New Zealand and South Africa? So, juxtapose uh, the two countries. So, I gave the example to say that I'm looking at a bigger picture here. It's not simply the Indian system versus the American system. Within the common law world, there are two extremes. There is one extreme where discretion is controlled. There is another extreme where judges have a considerable where, where judges have considerable freedom or a free hand in certain cases to impose a just sentence, which is why I gave this example. Okay, that's very good. So uh, you have also delved into the aspect of reasonableness in sentencing. And uh, you have said uh, the role, you've spoken about the role of the appellate court in reviewing a sentence for reasonableness. Mm -hmm. uh, India, we see uh, sometimes that uh, there is a vast difference on uh, what happens in the district judiciary. Mm -hmm. Then it is reviewed and then it goes to the Supreme Court. Uh, 
you have also reflected on the United States sentencing guidelines here. Can you delve into the aspect of US sentencing guidelines, uh, the issue of uh, review in, at the appellate court level and India also? So as far, let's deal with the US sentencing guidelines first. That's a simpler concept. If yes. I may say. The US and in America, as far as the sentence goes, the nature of the review is that of abuse of discretion, which entails two things. The first being procedural reasonableness, rather a procedural review, where you simply, where the review is simply constrained to the fact that if the judge has not referred to the guidelines, which are advisory in nature, or if the judge considers, on the other hand, those guidelines to be mandatory even after 2005 when they were made uh, merely advisory, that's when you strike it as being procedurally unsound. The other is where you look at reasonableness. You go into the merits of the case. There, of course, the defendant or the accused comes and says his or her piece. The victims come and says his or her piece. And on the basis of that, the judge has to see if this is, if the law, the appellate court sees the law court has abused its discretion to a point where the sentence as a whole is unsound. And accordingly, on that basis, which is a, based on the facts, it's a it's a factual analysis which is done there. In India, on the other hand, again, you have a reasonableness analysis of sorts. You, the procedural aspect of it goes out of the window, for we don't have such guidelines. When in an appeal, when you appeal to a higher court, of course, in addition to very often rather practically, you appeal both your conviction as also your sentence. That's a common practice. It's appeal, uh, it's your conviction plus sentence. There it's a reasonableness standard. There you see, were there enough mitigating circumstances to have reduced your sentence? There you see, were there enough aggravating circumstances to increase your sentence? For instance, in a recent decision of the Supreme Court in uh, Navjot Singh Sidhu in 2022, the Supreme Court increased the sentence, taking note of the fact that there were a number of aggravating circumstances which had not been dealt with by the lower courts. That was again based on the facts of the case and on the idea of whether the sentence was A, reasonable, B, proportionate. Now, uh, going forward in your article, you have discussed additional safeguards and constitutional limits uh, on the issue of sentencing. Can you reflect on that for a moment? So in my article, I have dealt with certain additional safeguards that have come into play in the United States. And these are very important. If one looks at them, these are very important safeguards in our current atmosphere in India, for that matter. Number one, the judge or the sentencing judge will not consider the accused person's religious beliefs or political beliefs. Okay. Number two, statements which have been obtained in violation of the right to, uh, right, right, violation of the privilege under the First Amendment will not be uh, considered by the judge. The judge will not consider statements which have been made direct uh, by the accused to the public prosecutor while discussing a plea bargain or the possibility thereof. These are very important factors, more so in the American system where the sen sentencing judge is allowed to look at even inadmissible evidence while imposing a sentence. So these factors okay. are there, of course, in the American system. One ought to incorporate these in the Indian system also. But before that, that, that's a long way. That's a long way there. I think first, the need of the hour is for there to be a certain mandate where or a, a certain policy of sentencing in India. What's interesting in India today is, I'll give you an example rather. The other day, I was reading certain judgments, again, on the point of sentencing, interestingly, recently, where I the same court the same court and the same judge of that court in two judgments which were passed three years apart in one judgment says that the policy of sentencing in India is deterrence. And in the other judgment says that the policy in India is rehabilitation reformation. 
And imagine if I'm relying on that judgment, or if a judge, a sentencing judge, a trial court judge is looking these, at these two judgments by the same court, what does he or she think? How is he or she supposed to proceed? So I think the first thing that we need to do in this country is to have a sentencing policy. What so is it we're trying to do? What are we trying to achieve? If the offense, now interestingly, and I'm sure you've seen and a lot of your viewers who are lawyers have also seen, if you look at judgments involving heinous offenses, you look at murder, you look at sexual offenses, there the policy, or if not the policy, if the policy doesn't come out from the bare reading of the judgment, the undertone is that the policy in India is deterrent, it's retributive. While on the other hand, when you're looking at petty offenses and people are let off on the payment of a simple fine, there the undertone, or in some cases, it's clearly mentioned that there are policies to rehabilitate, reform the, uh, the accused. So first we need a policy, and this is a legislative task. Legislative. Yeah. So we are, of course, policies are legislative tasks. Uh, 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 going forward, uh, uh, reflecting on what you have uh, written in the article, uh, in relation to cases involving drugs smuggling and drug, the overall issue of drug abuse, you have said that in particular some cases judges have gone beyond the formal sentencing limits. Could you explore that area? Please? So again, this is a place where I'm referring to American law. So recently there's been a shift where okay. Initially, after the post Booker era, which was the judgment which made the sentencing guidelines merely advisory, the 2005 decision of the US Supreme Court, initially, drug offenses were being dealt with somewhat lightly. It's a recent trend where judges have started make, taking an upward departure as far as drug offenses are concerned, taking into account situations such as if somebody is selling drugs near a school, then in those cases, judges have taken an upward departure to a large extent. Okay. So that's dr drug, drug abuse, etc. is anyway a big issue in America today. Okay. In a lot of the metros there, dr drug abuse is it has become an issue, more so amongst... You mean young... uh, our judges is pointing to a societal crisis? Precisely. Now, also reflecting on uh, the Booker ruling that you did in your article, uh, you spoke about racial disparities in sentencing uh, and their mitigation. Would you reflect on that? So now this is a very interesting question. It's the opposite of what the guidelines, in fact, intended to achieve, or rather the post-Booker era intended to achieve. The guidelines came into play on account of disparity in sentences and what was unspoken of to, to a large extent was the fact that a lot of these disparities were racial disparities. Yes. As we all know, that has been a problem in that country. So they brought about these guidelines. Post the guidelines coming in, of course, there was uniformity in sentences. Uh, but as I've mentioned earlier, and even you highlighted, there were certain situations where the sentences were not individualized. So Booker did away with the mandatory nature of the guidelines, keeping them merely advisory. Again, hoping that while these guidelines are there, disparities will still be on the downfall. But sadly, there are recent surveys in the last five, seven years in America, where they've noted that after the guidelines have become merely advisory, these racial disparities which were at play till the 1970s, early 1980s, have come back into the play. They have come back into the picture. So, so that society is also fighting uh, racial disparity. Uh, it's not uh, as easy as to eradicate. Uh, India, of course, the problems could be more complex on account of caste, uh, language, region, religion, uh, uh, of course, a lot of population. Uh, we go to the Indian model that you have discussed in the article. Uh, and uh, you reflected on the 19th century English law that we derive our laws from. Can you reflect on your uh, introduction of that? So, 
as I mentioned, and I've written in the article, our Indian yes. law has been derived by, from uh, English, law, English law. Now, as you'd asked me earlier about the UK model, the difference that, that's there is that the English law has changed. Our it, law, has. it has changed. It has changed. In fact, in a lot of spheres, English law has changed. Sadly, we are still, sadly, we still refer to the same law. We still have the same law which was there in the 19th century as we derived it from England. There are, of course, certain local state amendments, etc. But largely, the law remains the same. And what saddens me is mm -hmm. even the proposed laws, the proposed IPC, proposed CRPC, the sentences, sentencing regime, the discretion, it remains the same. This was now, a really opportunity. You have, you have uh, Samarath, referred to sections uh, 248, 325, 360, 361 of CRPC. Uh, and uh, also reasons to be recorded in writing that aspect. Could you reflect on what uh, 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 argument you're trying to make? So the argument I'm trying to make here is that there is Indian law, of course, the CRPC, the provisions 235, 48, 325, 360, 361, though they deal with probation. The CRPC provides for sentencing, appeals as far as sentencing against... Uh, lesser sentence or a higher sentence than certain, which in fact indicates appellate control as far as sentencing is concerned. Our law deals with it. There is, our law also provides for certain safeguards or guardrails as, which would be a better way to call it, where when you're imposing a sentence, you have to record your reasons in writing. Yes. While that is there, you have the base level one, possibly level two as well. But what you don't have is a yardstick by which a judge is to ascertain what is a just sentence and what is an unjust sentence. What is a lesser sentence? What is a higher sentence? What is the perfect sentence in this offense? Keeping in mind factors of the accused victim, etc. So I'm referring, that's the idea no. behind these provisions. No, you're saying something. I was mentioning that that's the idea behind referring to these provisions to say, while there is something there, we need more. This is not enough. Now, and, uh, you referred to, uh, you referred to uh, factors of consideration when you considering a death penalty and you referred to a few cases. Can you reflect on that? What factors uh, uh, did you reflect on and also refer to a few cases? Absolutely. So I'll actually start off where I left earlier, as far as those provisions are concerned. Mm -hmm. So while, as I was saying, while we have those provisions, that, that'll better answer your question. While we have those provisions, what we don't have is a yardstick for the judge to decide how to impose the perfect sentence or a just sentence, which is why judges in India have to look at decisions or precedent, precedent which guides them on how to impose a just sentence. So the judgments I referred to are Bachchan Singh and Machi Singh, the two celebrated cases from the 1980s relating to death penalty, where they said that when you're imposing a death penalty, you have to look at five factors. Manner of commission of the offense, motive of commission of the offense, the nature of the offense, the anti-social abhorrent nature, the magnitude of the crime, and the personality of the victim. Initially, in the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, these were factors which were looked at or referred to insofar as imposition of death penalty was concerned. In 2014, the Supreme Court, in a very interesting judgment in Sunil Dutt Sharma, said that the same principles will also apply. You look at the same principles also for off offenses other than those where the penalty to be imposed or penalty that can be imposed is death sentence. So now, okay. of course, in all, all criminal offenses, we look at these factors. Of course, in addition to these, there has been a recent change, positive changes where, you're, where the approach is becoming more victim-centric now. In the last 8-10 years, the concept of victimology has really... Uh, been evolved as in by the Indian judiciary. 
So, of course, there are more factors, qua victims and the rights of the victims, the loss suffered by the victim, not only actual physical loss, but also emotional loss. That's being concerned, uh, considered now. Are you seeing it in commentary or in judgments? You're seeing this in judgments also. There's, uh, in fact, there is this decision of the Supreme Court in Jagjit Singh, where they deal with or deal with the right of a victim to be involved in every phase of a case. Then Navjot Singh Sildhu, the recent decision of the Supreme Court said that the victim has to be heard at the stage of sentencing. There was another recent decision of the Delhi High Court where Justice Midda dealt with the rights of a victim to the extent of saying that the sentence is not enough. While the sentence will be imposed, in addition, rather sentence in the form of imprisonment, while imprisonment is not enough, in addition to imprisonment, one also needs, the, the, the accused also need to compensate the victim for the loss suffered by him or her. And this compensation, unlike the old regime, has to be calculated in terms of rather how it would be calculated in a civil dispute. So it goes beyond the fine which is there in the IPC. In addition to this, 2009, the amendment to the CRPC, 2009 amendment, which brought about 372, changed, uh, which brought about 372, is also, also denotes the victim centric approach that we are slowly and steadily evolving. Where a victim can file an appeal against a sentence, if the victim is not happy with the sentence, to say the sentence is not enough as for the victim, the victim can approach the higher court. Uh, uh, in your article, uh, uh, this is an interesting, uh, 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 in a sense, explanation you gave on this issue. In the High Court, uh, but no, reflecting on the Supreme Court, what Supreme Court said that uh, uh, the sentencing ought to be stern, but also have mercy where it is required, is what you said in the article. Uh, uh, can you explore this area more? Uh, for the same crime, uh, uh, so, so two crimes which uh, are resulting in the same kind of charges, where do you look for mercy? Where do you look for sternness? So stern, sternness, of course, you look at to say that there is, you've got a sentence, you need to teach, make sure the person does not commit the same offense again. You need to make sure that others in a similar position do not commit similar offenses. That's the sternness aspect to it. You have to set an example. And for that, you look at the factors of manner of commission, motive, etc., the machi singh, etc., factors. How, at the same time, when you're looking at mercy, you look at factors such as what led the person to commit the crime. Was it a pre-planned, premeditated case, offense, act rather? Or was it an act that was done out of thoughtlessness or out of desperation? I'll give you an example. Today, you're looking at two people. Both these people have robbed a store. One person robs the store to make money of it. Simply put. The other person robs the same store. The other person robs the same store so as to get something to eat for his children who are practically dying out of starvation. The second person's circumstances or what led him to commit the offense or the motive behind the offense is definitely a factor which needs to be looked at as far as mercy is concerned. You have to be somewhat merciful to the, to the second person while stern with the first person. The sentencing as a whole, sentencing has to be a holistic exercise. And as we discussed earlier, it has to be individualized in this aspect. Individualized to person one and person two. Sometimes uh, bringing out uh, a person's uh, problems or what you can say under what circumstances he committed uh, a particular crime, isn't it also dependent on the skill of the lawyer uh, to bring these aspects out uh, rightly or wrongly? It's, I completely agree, it is dependent on the skill of the lawyer. At the same time, it is also dependent upon the knowledge of the lawyer. 
which often creates a problem when you look at a country as large as India, where a lot of what you see are mitigating circumstances you're getting from precedent. If the Supreme Court says something today, sitting in Delhi, I know the Supreme Court has said in its judgment, I have access to these decisions. Assume, assume if I'm sitting in, again, in a rural part of India or a semi-urban part of India today, where I, as a lawyer, do not have the same access that a lawyer in Delhi would have, where the judge sitting in a court in a semi-urban rural area does not have the same access as a judge sitting in a trial court in Delhi, where you don't know what the factors are. Of course, it makes a difference, which further leads to disparities in sentencing. Now, if, uh, looking at the aspect of what you have also discussed in the article uh, about uh, legal assistance in India being an issue, uh, also people with ample financial resources are able to bulldoze through the system. In a sense, they can get their cases heard. They have lawyers who can, you know, um, raise it before the judge. You know, things come by easily when you have good legal assistance. Uh, why have you mentioned this? What you're trying to convey through this aspect? If you could explore more what you've said in there. If, let's take the same example. Urban area versus rural area. Okay. I'm somebody sitting in a rural place, convicted there, sentenced in a rural place. Where, of course, knowledge takes a lot of time, sadly, in India to reach our rural areas. It's a very sad mm -hmm. state, as we all know. It, knowledge or judgments or these principles, they take time. A person is sentenced, say, extremely harshly. The person wishes to appeal to a higher court. Number one, knowledge about the fact, as far as the lawyers there are concerned, as to, fair enough, there are certain factors which have not been considered, and it's a good case for appeal, qua sentence. That is hurdle number one, as far as legal assistance is concerned. Only if somebody knows these mitigating, aggravating factors, which are being developed on a daily basis. Say if a trial has been going on for a very long time, a protracted trial, is that a mitigating circumstance? Is that an aggravating circumstance? You need knowledge to, the, you need knowledge, you need access rather. I'll say access, not knowledge. Access to the most recent decisions, the most recent principles being laid down by a higher courts to ascertain whether it's a case fit for appeal on the point of sentence. The other hurdle is that of lack of finances. For me to go from the court of a magistrate to the court of a sessions judge to the high court and finally to the Supreme Court requires a lot of money. And if somebody, if you're well, if you're well off, you'll bulldoze your way through as you rightly said, you don't mind spending that extra money at level one, two, three, or four, and finally getting what you deserve, the just sentence from the Honorable Supreme Court. But for somebody who does not have the resources, how do you expect that person to go beyond even the Sessions Court? Fair point. Uh, well, uh, when we move ahead uh, in the article, you've spoken of aggravating and mitigating factors A. We have also spoken of erratic uh, 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 judgments. Uh, could you reflect on that aspect? Let's talk about erratic judgments first. There's a very interesting erratic judgment that I've referred to. In fact, the first time I read this judgment, I was in a state of shock. The Madras High Court, while imposing death sentence on a person, this is the case of Oma versus State of Tamil Nadu, it's a 2013 decision of the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court was, uh, where the Supreme Court, where a case had come to the Supreme Court from the Madras High Court, where the, where the Madras High Court had imposed the death sentence without even referring to the Bachchan Singh, Machi Singh factors. Imagine, you're talking about taking a person's life and 
you don't even refer to the factors which have been laid down by the Supreme Court. So there is this issue of erratic decision making, erratic sentences rather in a country as large as ours. You have also reflected in your article, uh, as you were saying now, on inconsistencies that grew uh, in semi-urban and rural parts. Thus, the, I mean, it's an observation that also would have bothered you when you said that... Uh, sorry. sorry, I lost you. I'm really sorry I yes. lost you again. Yes. So, am I audible to you now? You're audible, very much so. So, uh, you also reflected on inconsistencies, as you were saying, in uh, uh, rural and semi-urban parts where Supreme Court judgments were uh, uh, not considered also when findings the judge. So, uh, when you found this and you went in the article, do you see these things improving or in a large country like India, it is a bit difficult? We have to admit. Of course, the situation is improving. I won't deny that. The situation is improving. But at the same time, it's very difficult in a large country like India. You know, where, as I, I'd mentioned, rural versus urban areas, semi-urban areas, there is a difference in approach. There is a difference in access when you look at these areas. So it is taking time. It is taking time while the situation is improving. It's taking time. We also see situations of erratic sentencing. We also see situations of varied sentencing uh, disparities. Now, uh, uh, there's a line in your article where uh, you say disparity arising out of over discretion is a real and apparent problem in India. However, in absence of a coherent yardstick, it is difficult to point out the disparity in sentence. Uh, what happens is that uh, when the media goes on to report uh, many of these uh, cases, uh, certain cases will have disproportionate attention sometimes on because uh, uh, there has been a sentencing which is seen as lenient. In some cases, the very hard uh, sentencing, and even that too gets reported. You know, the extreme ends always get reported more than what happens on an average daily. Uh, and you've gone on to explain and give your reasons of what the Supreme Court has observed in a number of cases. Could you reflect on what you meant to say? So you mentioned something very interesting that media attention. Very often, Media attention also impacts the kind of sentence that's pronounced in a case. While, of course, nobody will deal with it. It's not written about. It's not mentioned. It's not nice it's to speak. It's definitely not nice to talk about this, but it's natural. If you're human, it's naturally bound to play on your mind. Which is why in a number of cases, the Supreme Court imposes gag orders saying that certain cases or certain factors you're not supposed to do, you will not report on. That's something interesting. I've not dealt with it in my article. Right. But it is it is important, definitely. In the end, uh, uh, you have also reflecting on uh, a certain criticism about the Indian uh, judiciary widely about disparity in sentencing. And you call for A, sentencing guidelines and B, the National Sentencing Commission. Uh, and you've referred to committees. And Could you reflect on that for a so now looking at the American system again, as far as their guidelines are concerned, in India, as we've discussed, sentences very often tend to be varied, not consistent, at times disproportionate, maybe too high or too low. Taking note of this, the 2003, 2003 report of Justice V.S. Malimut's committee recommended that there, be, that there be some sentencing guidelines or if not sentencing guidelines, at least a sentencing council in place in India. His findings or his recommendation was echoed in 2007 by uh, um, Professor uh, Madhav Menon in his uh, committee, in his draft, in his report. Then again, recently, Professor Mrinal Satish has also, in his book in 2017, 
called for their being sentencing guidelines and a sentencing commission in india based on this and again we look at this as i had mentioned the uh, justice malimat's committee the professor madhav menon's report mr professor mrinal satish's book all three have called upon or rather recommended that there there be sentencing guidelines and a sentencing commission in india to deal with disparate treatment as far as imposition of sentences is concerned as a first step we ought to have this taking from their reports even i recommend that there should be one sentence a sentencing committee two sentencing guidelines but at the same time looking at the american example and seeing how the sentencing guideline and the sentencing us sentencing committee has worked there taking the positives from there i for my recommendations go further to say number 1 keep the sentencing guidelines advisory like they are in america number 2 sentencing the act of sentencing all the act of sentencing has a direct correlation with the cry of the society what the society is concerned with today the society will not be concerned with or may not be concerned with 50 years later hmm. so review the sentencing guidelines on an annual basis that is another recommendation that i have made in my article which is very important you look at for instance fda offenses adding say saccharin to saccharin or cyclamide to some food while it was a very big issue 50 years ago today you are let off on payment of a fine while of course the law has changed there the law the, the sentence prescribed has changed but the cry of the society that's reflecting the cry of the society which has changed which is why the sentencing commission if and hopefully when hopefully soon for that matter put into place should review its guidelines on an annual basis i further go on to recommend that if nothing else at as a first step our legislative should evolve or should should act should evolve or should lay down a sentencing policy sans a sentencing policy it is very easy to impose the maximum sentence without looking at any mitigating circumstances or in some cases to impose the minimum sentence again without looking at aggravating circumstances i have made another recommendation which was in fact i brought, i haven't really made that recommendation i've emphasized the recommendation of the supreme court in 1979 the supreme court while hearing the case of dilbag singh versus state of punjab made pre sentencing reports mandatory in cases where uh, uh, in in cases where uh, death sentence was being or death penalty was being imposed if we can do that for those cases why not do the same exercise for all criminal offenses at least that will guide our judges better and it'll guide our judges in the absence of anything else there'll be something to guide our judges that's a, that's a uh, 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 well uh, the, your last paragraph in your article is very interesting uh, second last paragraph uh, where you say that uh, in absence of a philosophy individual judges uh, apply their own philosophies uh, which leads to national and intra state inconsistencies in sentencing uh, this is a worrying uh, uh, thought isn't it it is a worrying thought and it's a real thought it's happening on a daily basis it's happening on a daily basis you look at the same crime committed in the capital versus the same crime committed in another state in in india i will not be surprised if the sentence imposed in the two cases is completely different one being the minimum the other being the maximum and i will not be surprised if there is a clear reference to a particular policy in both the cases if there is no clear reference then the undertone makes it clear as to what policy the particular judge is referring to or relying upon 
it's a it's a worrisome state of affairs so i uh, when when you go through this whole piece that you have penned uh, it's food for thought but in your last line you say that uh, we need to imbibe some elements of the american uh, uh, sentencing model uh, can you highlight which are those or uh, those all all those guidelines we can uh, uh, may be made applicable to india since it's been well thought out or it would be different uh, keeping in mind the indian uh, subcontinent it As, has, sorry you were saying something yeah no please come so it has to be different we are very different societies the we are very different societies our laws are different um so naturally we need to or rather we ought to imbibe certain elements of that system not everything and at the same time we need to change those elements to suit the needs of our society and our legal system i say one we should take the american uh, a similar concept to the guidelines rather let's start with the fact that we should have a sentencing commission one two we need to have similar guidelines at play three like in america those guidelines ought to be advisory and not mandatory like to the post 2005 america they need to be advisory at the same time there are certain flaws in the american system where the same sentencing guidelines have been applicable whether mandatory or advisory since the 1980s till the mid 2020s now till 2023 we should differ from the american system to the extent that the guidelines should be revised on an annual basis as i said the sentence any sentence is important to meet the needs of the society to answer to the cries of the society the cries of the society are bound to change society keeps on evolving society is not constant and accordingly our law also has to evolve with the society so of course we need to take these elements and the guidelines also can be a little different offenses as they are prescribed in india are not are different from the offenses prescribed in america the range of sentence as we have in india today is different from the range that is there in america so we need to make these changes but the meat of the matter remains the same we need to have guidelines we need to have a sentencing council so this a uh, 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 lot of interesting uh, examples anecdotes uh, observations on the model of sentencing we got to know from you today uh, this interesting two part series which ended now uh, also uh, a lot of what you said may also have to come from the parliament some guidelines of course the supreme court can uh, via its orders give some other things may come from the parliament uh, where i would like to refer uh, what uh, tom bingham the lord chief justice of england and wales once said that we need leaders who better understand the rule of law he said it in context of the english society of course that is also applicable for india that's why we also running a campaign of late that we need more lawyers in parliament their numbers have come down from 32% to 4% uh, which is very with just 4% uh, lawyers as parliamentarians better law making may get affected uh, but uh, today this whole topic is about your article on uh, the american model of discretionary sentencing and lessons for india uh, it was interesting to talk to you get to know uh, so many insights that you have shared uh, cases judgments the disparities also uh we not only compared uh, india and america but also uk new zealand and other jurisdictions also were covered today it was an enjoyable session i uh, thank you for your time i also hope the viewers have enjoyed it very much uh, looking forward to see you again soon thank you thank you so much thank you so much thank you thank for you. having me my pleasure thank you
For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.